mom we knew was so many years after her jazz years. She was almost like a myth, a legend. It was hard to imagine that she actually had this career way back when. Having that kind of amazing career and then suddenly you're the mother of five children raising five kids in Nowhere USA. The piano is an extension of her. She is more comfortable playing than any other expression. My mother said when she was pregnant with me that she prayed to the Lord that she would have a musician. And she didn't she didn't know whether it was male or female, but she wanted a musician in the family. And she always said she got her wish. You know, you just got thrown in and you either played or got off the piano. I remember I sat in with in Chicago with Art Blakey too. I asked him if I could come up and play a couple of songs. This is still before I really knew how to play. And those guys were so great. They'd let you, you know, because I think they were just so fascinated. You know, some young girl would would want to come in and, and try to play jazz. I learned to play by ear by, by listening to my dad and so I, I started trying to play stride piano and then uh, I started playing boogie woogie. This is a picture of me when I was 12 and uh, I was playing with the local symphony orchestra in Enid, Oklahoma. Then I went away to Cincinnati Conservatory. Oscar Peterson. Because of him I became a jazz pianist. When I was in Cincinnati I went to uh, a concert jazz at the Philharmonic, and the only thing I knew about jazz, I had heard um, Sarah Vaughan and Billy Eckstein, but I'd never really heard jazz musicians. And I went to hear him, and he was just so phenomenal. And, and uh, so that was the night I decided to quit school and play jazz, which was a long road after that. First of all, I had to adjust from being a classical pianist to even learning how to play jazz. And so it wasn't a matter of learning the songs or anything like that, it was just the whole feel. agent came in, Clyde Trask, and he was uh, Doris Day's manager. And uh, so he started booking me in some clubs, just like I, just playing where I got fired, like I said, because you were supposed to be playing to, to kind of hustle in the guys. And, uh, and I was more interested in trying to find the, the same chords that Chet Baker and Jerry Mulligan were using. But I went to Dayton, Ohio, and that's where I met um, Bev Kelly. And we called ourselves the Modernists. And then we got a quartet, and we started singing. My, my friend Bev Kelly, she and I had the, had a quartet, and this is part of the quartet, and she was a great singer. She's still around too, she's in Los Angeles. There aren't very many of us, of us left. <laughs> uh, it was when I played in Chicago on uh, Rush Street at the Cloister Inn, and that's my mother, and that's my little boy. And that was a big jazz club, and that's where I, I met 
there's so many people. Publicity pictures. <laughs> that was at the Cloister Inn. There was another publicity picture. Good old folder shop. I think that's Scotty's space, up our old, at the Cloister Inn. And we traveled the whole jazz circuit. And that's where I met Scotty. <laughs> Scotty LeFaro was a young genius bass player. He, he ended up playing with, with Bill Evans and everybody, Ornette Coleman, you name it. And Scotty started changing what, what a bassist could do because he said he wanted to play bass like John Coltrane would play. Well, the bass player is the pulse and the foundation. You know, he's, he's the bottom of everything you're doing. Great bass players, then you play something, and then they just play really beautiful melodic things through it while you're playing. It's very important. Well, Scott was way ahead of his time. Um, I have no memory of him. Apparently, apparently, I was born when they were working together. He used to push me in the stroller. I hear those stories, but um, but in looking back over the history of jazz, um, he was he was 20 years ahead of anybody else uh, at that time in terms of where the bass stood. Uh, as a jazz instrument. Well, the last time I saw Scotty, we were in Los Angeles. He had, he had moved to New York, and he came back to L.A. and uh, he called me, and we he wanted to go see Miles, and we went to see Miles, and we were listening, and it was really nice, and we were having dinner, and it was great. And then after we'd been there about an hour, right when Paul Chambers was was going to play his play a solo, Scotty just. Took my hand, we just got up and walked right in front of the bandstand, in front of Miles and Paul and Scotty said, Bye. <laughs> so we had a fight and I was really upset with him. So that was the last time I saw him. I the last time I saw him I was mad at him. And then I talked to Paul Modian, his drummer, later on. He said Scotty felt really, really bad about that. And then about uh, four or five days later he was killed in a car wreck. One night when uh, Miles was playing at Birdland and Scotty sat in with him and after he played Miles put his arms around and kissed him right in the mouth because <laughs> he was just such a genius. I was playing at the Hickory House and uh, he came in and he said, Patty, let's go. There's this piano player I want you to hear. Oh, he's fantastic. And so we went to the Blue Angel, I think it was, and Bill was playing there. And I had never heard him. And it, when you heard Bill Evans, especially the first time, it was like listening to Mozart, somebody like that. And uh, so I listened to him and I was crying. It was just so beautiful. And after he played, Scotty said, come on, Patty, come on up. Come on up, let's go play. I said, are you serious? Do you think I would go up and play after somebody like that? And he just grabbed me and forced me. And we went up and played. And, and the reason, it wasn't that Scotty wanted Bill to hear me. He wanted Bill to hear him. <laughs> and it was after that, you know, shortly after that, that he started working with Bill. So he used me, a little sucker. <laughs> But that was really, really, Bill Evans was a very nice guy, really nice. One time he, some friends brought him over to my house in the evening because he was going to kick, he was trying to kick drugs. And so I guess he was gonna stay. They wanted to have him have a place to stay. And so he came over and uh, I had a piano there and he sat and played for me for about two hours. He just sat and played and we just talked about music and theory and harmony and all that, and, and then he left. 
he probably wasn't going to be able to stay kicking at my house, you know, so he, they, they all left. And then I went kind of downhill for about 10 years. You know how it is when, when anything goes, you know, there's, well, the thing about having God is it, it gives you strength in life and it, you know, gives you a sense of right and wrong. And so you lose, when you lose that, just anything. We were products of the 70s and 80s, and so to think of my mom having a jazz career, it was like ancient. It was like Perry Mason movies. She was playing at Birdland and, uh, and the Sutherland in Chicago. I mean, these were some of the hottest jazz venues, and um, you know she can drop names with anybody. Count Basie used to come and sit on the piano bench next to her while she was playing just because he liked watching what she was doing. When I played in Jacksonville, I opened for Dave Brubeck. And here's a picture when I was playing with Terry Gibbs in the old Beehive days. When I came in, actually, when jazz was going out, because that was the people like Elvis Presley and rock and roll was starting. And so I have that funny story about Elvis, because I always said if I ever met him, man, I'd like to tell him what I thought about him. And so I was playing with Terry Gibbs at the Sands, and <laughs> Elvis came in, and he sat and listened to me. And after I played, he asked me to come over to his table. And I went over there, and he was the most handsome person I ever saw in my life. So I did, I did not tell him off. And I remember one night we were playing, and I was having a solo. And all of a sudden, everybody started applauding. And I thought, like, wow, you know, they must really like mine. And I turned around, and Sammy Davis was, was sitting in on drums. And that was the night all of them came in. Frank Sinatra, Peter Lawford, and this was my my husband's sister Margie, who sang with Vince Giraldi, and recorded on uh, Capitol Records. And I met my husband through her. She was beautiful and a great singer. You're on the road, you know, you don't really live anywhere. And if you have kids, and then you're playing to all hours of the morning. There were some times before I met Mike, you know, that I, I was frightened. And, and lonely. And my mother at that point was ready to get out of the music scene. She was kind of burned on it. And I was so happy because I, I just wanted a normal life, you know, not, not having to stay up till three and four in the morning playing and just to depend on Mike. Allison was with us at that point. There were no, uh, no McCoy babies yet. My mother actually considered putting her up for adoption because she was unmarried, she was having another child, and uh, didn't think that she could handle it. There was just kind of a camaraderie when we first met that she understood the uh, the hard times and we were we both were you know raised in uh, Baptist churches and uh, we both uh, backslid to the uh, really backslid. Actually I lost my faith when I was playing at the Hickory House in New York. Because that was the time of Bertrand Russell and God is Dead and all, none of the musicians believed in God and I didn't know much about the Bible and so I couldn't defend my belief, it was just emotional. There was a lot of darkness in it and she had a number of very close people uh, die with needles in their arms. She said, Mike, if we're going to survive as a family, we're going to have to get out of show business. And he was different, you know, because he was not a musician and he was so young, and um, he was missing a tooth here, so he looked like a hillbilly. So the first thing Patty had me listen to when I, put, when I moved there was Bill Evans, remember that? I couldn't stand Bill Evans. I was a hick, and uh, I remember when Patty used to introduce me to those famous people, and as I was telling you, I met uh, Hank Mancini, and I would just kind of freeze, didn't I? He eventually said, I'm going back to Oregon, where he had spent some time as a child and said, I'm going back to Oregon, I'm going to go to college, come with me or not. 50 years. 
Yeah. She's a sweet, lovable woman. She's, she's a very kind person putting up with me. I think with Mike and I, we were so opposite. I'd never known anybody but jazz musicians. And that's all they ever talked about was jazz, drugs, whatever. And then I met Mike, and, and uh, I'd never met anybody like him. And so we both just disagreed about everything, and, and we were attracted to each other. <laughs> I, thought, I think that's why we liked each other. It'll be such a great day. started going to these house meetings and, and church meetings of these Pentecostals and she went in defiant because she had spent the last 30 years of her life absolutely just detesting anything to do with that. The irony of it, um, God's sense of humor is played out a lot in this family. And we walked in and this woman was there, they were two evangelists and, and uh, they went around and, and they cast devils out of people in prisons and in insane asylums and stuff. And and so I walked in and she was playing an auto harp and then she had an accordion on the side. And then her husband, who was the minister, uh, didn't have any teeth. Music that she would never be moved by because it was not by you know people who were well skilled on their instruments. But God used that and kind of it humbled her. So then we sat down and he started just reading out of the Bible. And I, and I had the Bible and I was looking at it. And he was reading the story of Paul and Silas when they were in the dungeon and the earth, they had an earthquake. And as he was talking, this feeling started coming over me. And it was just like the, the letters in the Bible just started crystallizing. I don't know how to, how to explain it. And I, I started having a vision, and I was in the, the uh, prison with Paul and Silas. And when the guard came running, he says, what can I do to be saved? And I thought, oh, don't say it, don't say it, because if you say it, because I knew what the, what the answer was, and I knew that I'd break down, start crying, and make a fool of myself. All the, All the diamonds and precious things. Mike, I said, you know, I got to get out of here because I'm coming apart. And but I, I tried to get up and I could not. I just couldn't get out of my seat. And all of a sudden, I just started weeping. And it was like this peace came over me, and God was just rocking me and and giving me the kind of love I needed. And uh, the lady that I had made so much fun, all of a sudden she was over there kneeling and praying for me. She looked kind of like an angel. <laughs> and that was the day I was changed. I never went back. It'll be such a good day. It'll be <laughs> such a great day. It'll be such a... She was still a jazz musician, but now she had a different purpose. She had a different uh, philosophy of life. I changed my life overnight. It was, you know, blind, now I see, and, and everything changed. My whole world changed. Everything looked different version story was very visual, very experiential, mystical, and really palpable at the same time. And she was transformed from that day forward, and her walk has deepened ever since. For a number of years, it was, uh, it was like a halfway house for young people in particular that they would connect with, and, and so many of them came from uh, very dangerous 
life situation. And then a woman named Bridget who came from France to because she heard about my mom and she ended up staying with us for years and was Kelly's nanny. The unique combination of my mother with the warmth, but also the jazz musician side. And then my dad, who was the intellectual. And so you're drawn in, and they're fun, they're irreverent, they're not by any means prudish or, you know, it's, they're fun to be around. And you always know they're Christian because it's, it's part of their daily language. I witnessed so many situations where people were hurting, and uh, Patty and Mike just have a sense about it. They just, they, they get right to the heart of it. That's why I say I think God's funny, because he knows how to deal with people, you know, to get them off their big ego. When I came here, I had to get some really kind of crazy, stupid kind of jobs for us just to kind of survive and everything. So I really wasn't a snob. <laughs> I was being humbled. <laughs> Playing at the Elks Club, places like that. Oh, the old elk. Yeah, she's never said that she regretted it. No. Not at all. Even after all those Elks clubs. <laughs> <laughs> her stuff is great. Her gospel stuff is amazing. When we were in Nashville, we were at Christ Church, which is a very well-known musical church. And she came and played and just blew them away. And you know, of all the times I played, the greatest reception I've ever had in my life was when I played at these churches. and. Uh, it, it was just, when I played at these churches, it was like playing a jazz concert because people were just so open, you know, and those, those are the kind of churches I like, you know, where people get up and move around a little bit. <laughs> And that's why, I, that's why I love the gospel, especially in a church or something. Everybody's yelling while you're playing, practically, you know, and, and, and so it stirs you, you know, and, and so it isn't like you're just sitting there playing by yourself. expanding herself always she never stops she, she's never going to retire she's pushing herself to always you know grow and change and never you know just get stuck I've gone back to classical I've gone back to my roots and I'm studying again I have a great teacher from Russia Because when you play Ravel or Chopin or something like that, it's easy, if you screw up just a little bit, it's easy to improvise a little bit, you know, because it, but with Bach, what are you going to do? You're going to have to stop and try to improvise a fugue. She's taking lessons from 
uh, Alexander Tutnoff at uh, Southern Oregon University, who's a masterful pianist, just taking lessons and practicing playing classical and, and going in and letting him say, no, that's not right. Classical pianists are playing pieces that where every note is already written out. It's a much different thing from jazz. And in order to stand out, you have to be able to put your own spin on each one of those pieces. And you do that without changing any notes, but by taking slightly different uh, dynamics approaches or, or slight changes in tempo or things that where you and the composer work together to make it happen. So she hears the jazz in it. She hears the the that jazz came out of that to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And so I think at this stage in her life, because she understands so much more about uh, chords and melody and, and all the intricacies, that she understands this music better and it speaks to her as a composer mm -hmm. as well. So I think part of what we're hearing in her playing is that she's not just drawing technique, she's drawing stylistic things and harmonic things that she was recognizing mm -hmm. in these other composers' works. That was beautiful. What are those intervals? <laughs> I don't know. They're kind of whole tone kind of thing. But the interesting thing is, is that we're hearing um, the results of this newfound appreciation for the subtleties of classical that she didn't understand when she was a teenager. That's my new love in life. My new love is to play classical and jazz. At a meeting one time, Mike and I were we were struggling, you know, financially, and we were going through it, and we were just and we had, I think, three kids at that time, and uh, so we were just praying, and this, this is in our kind of still our little bit of Pentecostal days, and everybody, well, you know, praying, <laughs> blah blah blah, and all of a sudden I did it was just quiet, and it's like I saw this wall. And I thought, uh, I, I felt this peace come over me again, that peace of God, it's impossible. It's like you become one with God. And I thought, you know, if I could, if I wanted to, I could go on over this, climb over this brick wall and be with God and never have to come back again. And it was just such an incredible feeling of joy and, and then, of course, then I thought, no, <laughs> I better not do that. And I came back <laughs> because, you know, I had children. One time you're really with it, you got it and all that, and then all of a sudden nothing, nothing. Then you're back, and, you, and so it goes back and forth. God knows how. God has kind of dealt with us that way. <laughs> so we're always pretty much on our knees. Okay, Lord, you know. <laughs> So that's one thing that I've developed through that is my faith. There's no doubt in my mind about the power of prayer because I've seen too many miracles. When, when 
have trouble in your life and the children or people, even the world, you can have that moment of intimacy with God and you know you're not alone. And you, you can have that oneness. And it's, there, the Bible says that peace that, that goes beyond understanding. And I've experienced that several times with God, just that wonderful joy, that wonderful peace. And that's what God does for me now.